Good morning. Um, this is Balaji Parthasarathy here, and uh, welcome you all for uh, VMware IT's uh, digital transformation using uh, cloud and mobile. So this is a webinar for today, and uh, really appreciate you taking time for this. Um, let me quickly introduce myself. I'm Balaji Parthasarathy again, uh, Senior Director IT from Enterprise Architecture. I take care of all the enterprise architecture for all the business applications support, supporting VMware business. Uh, so let's uh, get uh, get into this presentation as well as in terms of uh, the, the, the objective of this is going to be how uh, VMware IT has transformed from a typical um, back office operations into a catalyst for digital transformation and then uh, how do we enable uh, using our products and uh, ecosystems, right? So um, typically IT is seen as a back office operator, but it has been a great challenge as well as one of the uh, key drivers for transformation is uh, to be a catalyst, uh, enabling the organizations to move towards the future, right? Uh, going nearer to the future, far closer to the future. So what did we do? Uh, before we get into what we did, what we did right? Uh, so there are few aspects which is typical of any high tech industry or any industry for that matter. And these are the key challenges that any organization faces. Uh, to start with, any project is treated as a long and expensive project, taking about a quarter or so to get to va value to the market. Or uh, when it comes to an enterprise, uh, enterprise uh, organizations, there are hundreds and uh, hundreds of applications in the ecosystem, leading to a disconnected distributed ecosystem and disconnected architecture. Obviously, this disconnected architecture leads to the stale data driving business decisions and obviously bringing in suboptimal like employee as well as customer experience. And obviously, everything becomes in back office orientation. That's basically if you have to drive certain value to the market, it's based on how back office or what we call the business uh, applications can deliver deliver those value to the business, right? So it's basically, it's always long drawn in, in long drawn projects and initiatives. So let's talk about what we, uh, uh, what we did and what transformation has been brought in, in each of these areas. So when it comes to a long and expensive project, uh, uh, project constructs, it's all because of the way that we are organized, right? Um, it's basically a siloed organization constructs uh, with with the waterfall approach to most of uh, most of the problems that we try to solve and obviously the last mile the last mile is defined as uh, what it takes uh, once the once the, once the code is written tested uh, and released into production right so what is that last mile the classic question is if you have a blank line of code how long it takes uh, to get to production so that's a classic uh, question that is being asked and uh, it was probably, uh, it, it was again 2014 or before that, we were in the range of about uh, a month to three months to take the value to production. Uh, that's considering that a lot of these monolith applications need to be integrated, tested, and delivered into production as a set of releases, right? Releases on a monthly basis. So that's, that's where we were. Now with the, a change in approach, um, basically we are talking about a DevOps uh, team which is a self-contained team, uh, which takes care of all aspects of engineering, starting from continuous requirements to continuous delivery. And we got to a maturity level when the three fundamental aspects of philosophy of DevOps slash CACD is deployment ready, production ready code anytime, and zero or no touch deploy or one touch deployment. So we are uh, at this point of time, got to that maturity deployment ready and the code is production ready at any time. So, which means the value to the market uh, or the value to production has been transitioned from a typical months to weeks at this point of time. We have a capability to deploy on a daily basis, but consciously we have made an effort um, considering other operational dependencies, change management to deploy on a weekly basis. So we do have a um, capability to deploy on uh, when ready, that's on a daily basis as well. So, which means the last mile, is reduced drastically by 10x or 20x to get where we are today. So what does that buy us, right? It's a 50 percentage reduction in the delivery cost because you do not have a code which is in the uh, which is in the, your ecosystem which is not yet into production. So which means the code mergers and other uh, non-value added works that the de de development team need to cater to is completely reduced. So it reduces the 
delivery cost by feature by 50 percentage. We are able to release um, uh, uh, from a monthly, as we talked about, into deployment ready. So we have a capability to deployment ready. And we are talking about here about 8,000 features. Features is sort of an MVP, minimum viable service, or a product that can be used by the um, uh, business teams. Uh, 8,000 features, uh, which cuts across multiple uh, applications ecosystem here, because when we talk about uh, an enterprise uh, um, solution, it can touch upon ERPs, uh, it can touch upon the public clouds like SFDC, as well as in terms of custom applications. So these features touch across multiple ecosystems, and uh, we are able to deliver about 8,000 features per year and 100 plus releases year on year to date. That's the that's a, that's a speed at which the feature velocity that we are in. Coming to the disconnected architecture challenge that we talked about, uh, obviously disconnected architecture means every system um, or every application has a way of interacting. Obviously, uh, these interactions could be through well-structured well APIs, but obviously there are challenges when these, uh, these uh, um, uh, for data crunching or analysis, people do bring these data out and then use an Excel and a macros to make these uh, systems work, right? That's where when we were at that point of time. What we have done is uh, with the domain driven design constructs, we have, we have clearly segregated the domains and the service ownership of those domains. What it means is primarily the service is made available. The service in this context is a well, uh, well understood contract based APIs that is made available across the domains. So what we call uh, a domain is uh, within an anti-corruption layer, so which means you can, uh, uh, the, by discipline, by design, even within an ERP, um, the domains are well segregated, the services are made available, uh, the, the service owners do not cut across the anti-corruption layers, and these services are made available in a consistent way, irrespective of the, um, uh, the forms, right? Be it web applications or be it mobile applications. So, which means there is a consistency in data consumption. There's a consistency in data um, uh, 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 publishing as well as in terms of service ownership. So, which means uh, this, that is all these systems can bring together, uh, talk to each other in a very um, uh, abstracted way, not necessarily knowing what is the system of record behind that. So what does that mean? Uh, it has reduced our sales cycle time by 25% and the booking closure time book, uh, on a quarter on quarter basis by 50% reduction in uh, financial close. We talked about stale data. So obviously stale data means uh, the availability of uh, real time data to make decisions. This again becomes challenging because of these intermediate uh, uh, systems and excels and macros uh, that probably existed to make these systems operate in a seamless way. And as we talked about, um, a consistent contract-based APIs enables, irrespective of the form, in a consistent way, real access to those data in a real time or near real time to an extent when these APIs are published. And through the event pattern uh, uh, constructs, right, we are able to make sure that uh, the eventual consistency is ensured across the systems of record. So which means that data is almost near real time when it consumed with respect to the form, right? Be web or mobile. So what is it led to? Uh, basically we have 2000 plus business metrics consumed across multiple users, uh, right? 7000 plus users in a consistent way and real time visibility to all information like we even, even actual booking information at an exact level. That's that's an advantage of a contract-based constructs um, when it comes to a domain-driven design, and then obviously when it when it comes to suboptimal employee, customer, as well as the colleagues' experience. So we were able to bring in through this API model, uh, irrespective of the system of record, a sing single experience layer where we can get all the uh, all the application approvals, be it. Uh, um, hiring approval, be it uh, procurement approval, be it approval with respect to some of the uh, transactional information, order approvals, right? Everything is brought into a single uh, um, persona-driven 
aspects on a mobile application. So which means the access, the form remaining the same. The people did not bother about, at least at an exec level or a manager and exec level, need not bother about the system of record logging in. So the experience is um, great. Uh, obviously, it led to other aspects like uh, what we call we navigator or navigator capabilities where search going to multiple places. That's where we started with and we will talk about the mobile journey in subsequent slides. But in, in short, the foundation that we laid in terms of the contract based API constructs enabled us to transition faster into business mobility aspects. So today uh, we are able to deliver consumer grade mobile applications uh, based on this domain driven design as well as the service ownership and co well defined contracts and APIs uh, with 6.6 K installations across uh, um, people search. So there's one of the one of the mobile applications. Uh, we have a sales ecosystem applications, what we call sales pulse. Uh, about 2.6 K installations, enabling the field sales to managers, to country heads and geography heads and so on. And obviously uh, to 2.1 K installations of we approved by managers and executives and so on. Right. So approximately 70 percentage of the manager activity happens on this uh, one. We approve where it's one place to go for all approvals, uh, irrespective of the system of records. Obviously, this has brought in a mindset change uh, when it comes to delivery from a typical back office orientation to uh, how do I go from a uh, system of records to system of engagement. What it means is primarily what started as a journey as mobile also as some of the aspects that got into mobile only or mobile first constructs. So which means the, the product owners are thinking mobile as one of the key component of the solution and an experience layer that need to be brought in. So which means the whole design around the applications is in terms of, of service oriented constructs or service uh, or service ownership construct that we will talk about how we went about uh, in subsequent slides. Right. So um, that's a quick background in terms of what value that it's brought in and uh, any of these transformation, right? This digital transformation uh, has, as everyone knows, there are three aspects to it, the process, technology and people. And uh, typically what happens is uh, the process and technology is easy to adopt because always people are hungry or the, the team is hungry to experiment. But the people transformations, which is basically a shift in mindset, uh, in terms of uh, feature driven delivery, yet DevOps constructs is little challenging. And we'll talk about that because uh, 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 the, the fundamental aspects is there are multiple ways of delivering the solutions and there are multiple uh, applications involved, right? Some of them are packaged applications, which are monolithic constructs, right? By, by nature is monolithic constructs. And then the experience layer requires these uh, cloud native applications and the rest APIs and services that need to be consumed in a way that is easy. Right. So which means uh, the, uh, it is very uh, tightly interlinked. And what happens is the packaged application team, be it an SAP ER, uh, ERP team or an EBS ERP team or an SFDC for that matter, need to start thinking about a feature as an independently, independently deployable operatable unit and start delivering those service ownership uh, services and with this clear service ownership so that any consumer can consume, right? So uh, in addition to that, the DevOps constructs of uh, not getting into the trap of bimodal IT, right? Saying that the finance ecosystem can go slower than in the, um, uh, the cloud native applications because they need to be faster. But really reality is it's quite interlinked and everyone need to go at the same phase. So the mindset that we need to, what we brought in is, it doesn't matter. We don't get into the bimodal IT trap, uh, but uh, we will. Uh, yeah, everyone has their own speed and maturity at which they need to move forward, but adhering to the macro metrics and the macro um, cultural ecosystem. Uh, the macro metrics being the feature velocity on which they will be measured, uh, the cost of quality on which they will be measured, as well as in terms of uh, um, uh, deployment ready. That is basically ability to deploy the code when ready, irrespective of the ERP or uh, um, it is the it's a front end application. So, so what it translates to is and the three fundamental aspects of philosophy is deployment ready, production ready code anytime, and 
one touch deployment applies to both back office, real back office in like a financial system or a cloud native application as well. So we talked about it. Uh, so uh, a typical project delivery approach. Um, uh, that's where we were in as a technical partner, the requirements were provided. The solutioning was done by the IT organization. So what it means is basically uh, you translate into a solution architect architecture approach. Uh, you try to fit in in terms of constraints or you fit in in terms of what the new solutions and technology standards available and so on, right? That's a, that's a typical um, IT mindset. But being a catalyst, the mindset that is required, we talked about in certain aspects of it, but to quickly summarize, uh, yeah, yeah, agile and nimble delivery team, uh, what we talked about as a self-contained team, able to deliver everything um, within the same self-contained team, including taking it to production. Yes, CICD approach, foundations of the three philosophies, deployment ready, production ready code, anytime and one touch deployment, fail fast and learn fast, which means we are not constrained by the project uh, as a goal, but in terms of the value to the market is the goal. So which means the team is self-contained, um, <clears throat> able to decide uh, whether the, the, the approach is going to work or not using prototypes. What we also introduce something called prototypes as well, which means without uh, uh, doing too much of a coding, how do I make it happen? Uh, uh, test the waters fast and make a decision whether this approach will work or not, or make course corrections quickly. Mobility, uh, business mobility in that case, moved from a, a typical uh, mobile also to the mobile first or mobile only uh, constructs. And obviously we didn't boil the ocean here. We are taking a philosophical stand of what is uh, mobile, key mobile moments, which is important to the customer uh, or rather the business group and colleagues. And that's where uh, we will be investing. So it's not boiling the ocean, trying to translate every application capabilities into mobility. So we are taking a conscious mobile mobile moments constructs. And then IoT, uh, integrating these new, uh, IoT is one aspect of it, but all the new technology aspects, uh, we have a process called um, starting from a COE, a center of excellence to taking into mainstream through various pilots and integrating into the ecosystem and then obviously focus on developer productivity. To make it all happen, the developer productivity becomes a core constructs. And then what we realized in the developer productivity is the traditional way of uh, dealing with infrastructure or uh, of uh, um, the, the enabling tools, right? Uh, doesn't work. We need to have the product uh, developer have the power uh, in the hands of the developer to deal with IaaS or infrastructure provisioning or enabling those tools, right? So that's where uh, we transition. So which means it's a complete uh, cultural as well as the DNA change in the ecosystem, not restricting um, to only um, technology and process, but also in the people mindset. So ju to just to give a glimpse of, uh, uh, I'll quickly build this slide uh, to give a quick glimpse of what is our ecosystem when it comes to an infrastructure component. And we will also in subsequent slide talk about the application, infra uh, application footprint. Uh, so we are dealing with about um, uh, 169 offices spread across the geography, 16 data centers, 1.1 uh, million uh, plus uh, VMs destroyed and created and destroyed on a weekly basis. That's that's a volume. Um, so which means uh, enabling the developer to have the power and control on this infrastructure provisioning is important. Uh, dealing with about one plus one one million plus containers. Um, uh, talking about. Uh, production applications in VMware cloud. Uh, uh, that's one of the few things that we transition. We are talking about an 18 plus clouds, in, uh, sorry, 18 plus applications available on a multi-cloud or a hybrid cloud constructs um, on VMC on AWS. We'll talk about it subsequently, which means it enables us to deal with uh, uh, disaster recovery, uh, uh, sorry, disaster recovery in an easy and seamless way for 18 plus critical applications. Um, and then we are talking about uh, um, uh, the micro segmentations uh, for, for all our services and applications, right? We are talking about 69 applications, which are critical applications, well micro segmented using NSX. That's our ecosystem in summary. So, um, uh, so considering this ecosystem, right? The transition has been, as I said, little uh, uh, challenging, challenging purely from not from a technology or a process standpoint, but obviously we are an ecosystem where 2000 plus developers are involved, right? And uh, uh, if the objective is to give the power in the hands of the developers, 
and a, enable a culture of developer productivity then there are there are, we took a logical step by step process right the first step is making sure the instance is stabilized so when we say 2000 plus developers we are talking about, about a dev test environment being accessed by 2000 plus developers so in, any one day if the dev test goes down right um, you can imagine the cost involved uh, the loss of uh, 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 um, in terms of the cost as well as in terms of productivity so one of the fundamental things is bringing it to 99.95 uh, percentage uh, uptime uh, equal to production uh, production workload the second one is in terms of enabling the developers to provision those instances automatically, the IaaS instances automatically uh, using um, enabling tools. And then we are talking about a business agility using CICD where we will be able to take the uh, code um, on a weekly basis, right? Or even on a daily basis. So these are the three step approach that we took um, before we get to, a, to where we are today. And uh, when it comes to a cloud native platform journey, uh, the proof of concept started in 2014. Uh, Non-critical workloads uh, started transitioning in 2015, in, especially starting with the LAMP stack. And then uh, the cloud native applications, especially the PCF, uh, Cloud Foundry constructs sometime in 2016, that's where we started experimenting uh, uh, um, the pass uh, components. Then uh, this, with the success of these past components, uh, we transitioned all our mission critical workloads in 2017 and uh, um, transitioning into um, IaaS 2.0, that is basically increasing the, uh, increasing with all the necessary bells and whistles for customer, uh, sorry, developer productivity in 2018 and uh, transitioning into the TKG or um, uh, Tanzu Kubernetes ecosystem, uh, right, starting from 2019, right? So it has been a logical progression from where we started uh, from a typical pilot into um, uh, transitioning uh, uh, the low hanging fruits into mission critical applications. And now, now this is a way of life for us today. So to make it happen, we are talking about um, uh, when it comes to continuous delivery framework, we are talking about, obviously everyone knows about the continuous requirements, continuous integrations, continuous dev test and continuous planning, right? Continuous planning, right? But the, the, one of the things that is evolved is continuous infrastructure. So what we, as we talked about, right, the traditional way of in, infrastructure provisioning doesn't hold good in this fast moving phase. And so, which means there should be the power, power in the hands of the developer to churn, destroy instances at will, especially when it comes to cloud native applications. And then the continuous infrastructure capability uh, we are brought in to make this happen. So, um, in summary, we are talking about an architecture which is cloud native, enabled through standardization and platform standardization using uh, uh, Tanzu uh, family of uh, products, uh, TAS, which is starting with the PCF, and then the two, uh, uh, TKG uh, Tanzu Kubernetes grid. That's what we are making sure it's a developer ready infrastructure made available. And then automations uh, for all the necessary CI, CD and delivery aspects of it for the day one and day two from an operation standpoint, right? Uh, so we talked about uh, infrastructure uh, ecosystem and let's look quickly look at uh, the diverse environment from an application ecosystem, right? We are talking about here uh, 400 plus on-prem applications, 100 plus uh, software as a service applications like public cloud, SFDC and so on. Uh, we are talking about um, uh, 50 to 60 projects being executed at any point of time and 1000 plus active user stories. When it says user stories, these are features that is being deployed uh, or need to be transitioned and delivered, right? Uh, over a period of time, uh, say uh, uh, within, a, within a quarter or less than a quarter. That's, that's where we are. And a feature-based delivery. So we are, uh, we are transitioned ourselves into a feature-based delivery we talked about, which is an independently deployable, operatable feature that gets to um, production. And we are talking about 60 plus tech stacks um, uh, to deal with, right? It varied from um, ERPs. There are multiple two uh, ERPs in our ecosystem, uh, Oracle EBS, as well as SAP. Then we have multiple middleware in the ecosystem. There are uh, 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 um, the multiple public clouds in the ecosystem and so on, right? So best of breeds plus um, uh, the converged applications as well. So these are, this is our um, uh, application ecosystem that we are talking about, right? So when, when you deal with such a distributed ecosystem, the fundamental philosophy is how do you architect for the, uh, for the future? So 
there are two ways of looking at and it has it's nothing new it is it was put in by Mel, uh, melvin conway so, as early as 1967 he did an experiment according to his experiment which he did on cobol um, he asked a team to uh, develop a compilers right so he distributed the team into four four sets of team and then you can imagine the outcome is four pass compiler the four stage compilers that was evolved so this philosophy is the organization's architecture and designs are driven by how, what are the communication structures within the organization. And if there are four teams dealing with it, you will end up into four different stages or steps involved. And that's what the typical uh, traditional layered architecture is all about, right? The traditional layered architecture is we have a user experience team, then we have a portal team or uh, the front end team, then we have the middleware team, then we have the uh, the back uh, back end team, right? So when what happens typically is when you need to deliver a project, you need to bring all these team and all these technology skill sets together to deliver a project, right? So the objective of a DevOps culture is start working through right this philosophy and work on the inverse Conway's maneuver. Maneuver. What does that mean? Is basically start constructing your teams as domain organizations, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, when we said domain organizations, we said, okay, these sales is a domain, marketing is a domain, right? Um, and then finance is a domain, payments is a domain, subscriptions is a domain, right? Uh, so once you start having the domain teams, then enable them to be a full stack delivery organization. So we started with a rudimentary full stack or delivery organization constructors. Every developer need to know one stack up and one stack down, right? But over a period of time, uh, that self-contained team evolved to identify those or rather lean towards those tech stacks, which enable them to deal with all the from front office, sorry, front end to the back end. And then we converge on the Spring Boot or Spring, Spring Cloud as our ecosystem for our cloud native applications, right? And then uh, all the ERP related APIs started uh, uh, having a wrapper of uh, REST API constructs using Spring Boot, which enabled us to be able to consume across the domains as well. So which means that automatically created an ecosystem uh, where one tech stack was chosen and a full stack delivery organizations evolved within the domains as well. So, um, so which means every uh, uh, consciously we went to the architectural decisions of breaking the monolith. This is one example of a monolith uh, where the customer deals with all the entitlements, license entitlements and so on. It's a customer facing applications that we are talking about. It grew as one um, ball of mud, right? So what, uh, which means there are multiple subdomains within it interlocking each other, not very clear design of anti-corruption layer, what you're seeing here, and um, interacting across uh, each domain, picking the data from other domains, uh, right? So what we did is clearly segment those domains into subdomains, create a clear anti-corruption layer, define the contracts within that, expose those services, publish those services, version those services, create an API catalog, make it easy for the consumers to consume these information. So, so it's a very structured approach to each breaking the monolith. And we are, it's not that we have completed the journey, we are in the journey, but we are taking this approach in terms of domain driven design and then evolutionary architecture constructs to start breaking the monolith into domain driven designs subdomains with well distributed contracts and APIs which are exposed so that it can be consumed by any consumer, be it internal, external. So, which means uh, we talked about a transitioning from a layered architecture. That's what we talked about into a domain centric organization. That's where we started, right? So uh, we started breaking down uh, my VMware or VAPRO or these are some of the examples, right? Renewal teams into uh, a multiple layered architecture. Then the team evolved to uh, a full stack delivery organizations to start delivering everything using uh, Spring Boot, REST APIs uh, for consumer layer. Obviously, they have to deal with, in some cases, the ERPs uh, uh, um, in their ecosystem, which has their own technology stacks. So, so what has happened in this whole process is when the developer who need to bother in an uh, in a traditional structure across every aspects in terms of okay what is it mean for performance tuning what I need to deal with uh, uh, with respect to code uh, uh, performance and so on right for two yeah uh, pass situation right we are at this state where the developer need not really bother about 
the underlying ecosystem because that's taken care using uh, Tanzu ecosystem for us and the IaaS uh, constructs that we have. And really the developer focuses on the core value that he delivers basically data function and application. Right. So which means obviously when I said there's a reduction in 50 percentage cost on feature delivery and the feature velocity has gone about 20 X uh, time. That's purely because the developer need to focus on delivering the value component, which is application function and data, not really bothering about uh, the other underlying stacks. So what is our journey? We started with uh, uh, if you look at our e ecosystem, we are talking about 25 percentage of the ecosystem are custom applications. And out of this, when we started our journey, most of them were monolith in nature. And uh, we have transitioned into the stage two where it's a coarse grain services we are dealing with. That's obviously because of the challenge saying that uh, there are shared databases um, when it comes to ERP and other applications. We may or may not get into 100 percentage microservices construct with uh, the with in exclusive uh, data stores, but probably will be in mid, midway between these two. That's where we see. But at least the services um, are uh, transitioned and exposed as contracts and in a very microservices constructs, which means the service component is independently deployable, operatable, so it can be working right. Um, so it obviously brought in a change in the mindset of the developers that um, the traditional approaches, infrastructure supports uh, application availability. So, which means anything um, to be to make sure the infra application is available 99.95 um, percentage. I need to work backwards, make the infrastructure equally stable. Right now, it has gone to uh, philosophy change that application uh, need to deal with infrastructure non availability. So, which means high availability constructs, uh, multi data centers cross data center um, uh, uh, and seamless transition from one data center to another. So those things, the application ecosystem should be able to take care. So which means from deployment into multi data centers and so on, everything is redesigned architecturally. We start thinking differently. So which means the evolution as we evolved in our digital transformation into a cloud native um, architecture the ecosystem supporting that also evolved from uh, in, in, hand in hand. So we started with the Pivotal Cloud Foundry as a funda foundational ecosystem or platform as a service for all our microservices or cloud native um, applications. Now we are transitioning into uh, the Kubernetes constructs. Uh, basically, uh, there's also a maturity level involved because the P uh, PCF had, was more prescriptive in nature. And when you're dealing with the 2000 plus developers, uh, it was easy for those uh, uh, PCF uh, constructs where it is quite prescriptive what we need to do, what each developer need to do. And the PCF takes care of a lot of constructs. Kubernetes requires engineering maturity parallelly. And with this maturity right now, we are comfortable to get uh, into the, um, the Kubernetes constructs. But obviously, uh, there is there is a lot of advantage getting there because it brings you a lot of flexibility. And we've started uh, with uh, concourse and Bosch based services uh, offered um, for all our cloud native deployments. And that's where we started. But right now we are using vRealize automation uh, via VRCS uh, for all our uh, uh, cloud native deployments as well, in addition to the traditional workloads. So, uh, which means we use extensive components of VMware and Pivotal ecosystem uh, to cater up to our new needs, including observability includes uh, Tanzu observability by um, uh, 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 Wavefront for all our platform uh, pass uh, observabilities and then we realize operations and we realize login site for our application up, uh, and uh, infrastructure um, uh, observability, right? And we are stitching these all together what, to what we called event aggregator constructs, where uh, the correlations of these uh, would be visible uh, in a user experience layer for us to identify and solve problems. So which means the two fundamental constructors uh, uh, in a cloud native constructs, we, we know about it, right? Uh, mean time to resolve, mean time to identify or um, uh, triage, right? So this has come down drastically because we do follow the fail first, con uh, fail first construct, right? So with that approach, we, we should have a robust, robust day two operations. And this has drastically come down with these observability. Um, I'll take up uh, uh, 
quick dip into uh, we talked about the day one and day two and the more most important component of a day uh, day one is when the code reaches to production right and we will talk about the cicd uh, uh, and how did we eliminate or rather reduce drastically the last mile last mile with full automations using uh, vrcs virtualized code stream as our fundamental pipeline and what it means is primarily the wait uh, wait time is majorly associated with the manual decisions or rather i would say decisions for approval uh, of the ecosystem uh, of the code but most of it is no touch at this point of time from dev test to production right and uh, so which means that's where we are at this point of time to get to uh, uh, one touch deployment into production so uh, uh, what it means is basically uh, uh, it's 120 to 150 features per week that's where we are at this point of time uh, 3k uh, per feature in terms of quality so the quality of the feature includes uh, pre and post production quality and 18k per feature so which means uh, 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 it's primarily to deploy one feature which is used by the business we are in the range of about 18k um, uh, we probably it's about 50 percentage reduction in, in from where we started in 2015 time frame so uh, let's um, talk about quickly what does the CD pipeline means, and then what does instance uh, um, uh, optimization mean in this context, right? Uh, so there are two fundamental problem statements here. One is basically proliferation of instances. And in our ecosystem, when we talk about instances, we're talking about 100 plus, uh, or rather actually 400 plus applications stitched together. So which means you can imagine the cost that we need to pay for every instances uh, that we procure from any of these vendors like SFTC and uh, obviously on-prem cost and so on, right? So uh, there were about 27 plus instances and every project uh, was asking for an instance. Obviously it brings in the additional uh, uh, challenges of code merge, um, the code consistency, and also post-production challenges uh, because the product uh, 50 to 50 percentage, easily 50 percentage of uh, developer productivity was gone in making sure that the instances were up to date with respect to code merge and so on, right? So what we did is uh, we optimized that instances irrespective of the project, all project, we are talking about 60 plus project going in parallel, goes through a single instance path with the trunk based um, uh, uh, at least, I, it's not a perfect trunk base, I would say, but it's a trunk based um, uh, um, uh, constructs uh, with respect to uh, um, um, branching and so on. And uh, uh, the, the whole thing, how it works is primarily, we have the development the dev instance uh, where the code is being worked upon. Dev instance in some cases is also on the, on the laptop of the, uh, in case of cloud native and some, some of the, constructs of the developer but at the end of that development life cycle they check the check in the code um, and then the code gets deployed and integrated in the dev instances and then uh, after that it, it it propagates into ci instance continuous integration instance where there is an automation test suite that makes sure the build doesn't fail the fundamental aspects of the uh, ci instances when the code propagates to the cd instance or what we call test instance the high availability of test is ensured because we are going to talk about the business team um, multiple qa teams operating on it right so the high availability as long as the build is stable it's fine feature may or may not work right so, uh, the feature testing is in the test instance now uh, uh, if there are challenges uh, uh, in the uh, um, in the ci instance the development team is expected to rechange re that code and redeploy it, right? So there are thrice a deployment per day happens. And then the test is made sure with a 60 to 70 percentage in sprint automation uh, to make sure that the code is working as per the expectations and the feature, um, feature is delivered. And then on need basis, we go to the performance instance, um, uh, which is equal to production for all purposes or directly take it to test to production. So which means when you decide the future, you also decide the NFRs uh, in terms of performance requirements and so on, right? So it's very structured approach starting from a feature um, uh, requirements gathering or feature requirement delivery, which is in, uh, start thinking about as an independently deployable operatable constructs and the way that transitions across multiple instances, uh, rather five to six instances in total. So which means millions of dollars cut down on instance optimization and about for 50 percentage productivity of the developers uh, are focused on feature delivery rather than making sure the instances are stable. And just a glimpse of uh, what does each of these uh, um, uh, stages involve uh, from a dev 
continuous integrations, UAT and production. This is well phase gated pipeline on VRCS that we have delivered. And uh, these phase gates uh, obviously use is, uh, quite a number of tools associated with it to bring together uh, this one. But at, at the end of the day, Dev make sure uh, uh, that the code is stable. CA um, make sure that the code is stable and doesn't. Uh, it's ready for uh, in the test instance. It doesn't break anything. The build doesn't break. In addition to static code analysis and other security uh, scans that happens. Um, so which means the DevSecOps. We are matured into the DevSecOps, being bringing Sec into the uh, 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 development lifecycle itself, and then the UAT stage where uh, most of the uh, integration testing, uh, feature testing uh, happens before it gets to production. Obviously, the, um, performance testing happens in uh, LT instance. I think we talked about this. This is a, a presentation in other form. Uh, so obviously, this brings in uh, various dimensions of uh, 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 how we take the code, right? Of, we talked about situations where uh, uh, we are in the uh, we are in the stage where we, we can deploy the code anytime, but what happens when the business doesn't want to take the code into production, right? So they don't want uh, um, this feature for some whatever valid business reasons. They don't want the feature to be uh, used now or exposed to the customer immediately. So uh, there are maturity levels with respect to the code deployments, starting from toggling um, uh, um, or taking into dark releases, which means it is uh, we don't take the burden or debt of uh, code being maintained in the dev test instance, but take it to production. But at the same time, uh, it is not available or visible to the customer um, uh, or uh, he stage those code in the dev test instance itself uh, and take it together. Obviously, these are obviously there is some sort of challenge or compromise here and trade offs here with respect to the code maintenance. Right. So um, there are various aspects of it which is matured uh, in our ecosystem and with this right we are able to cater to all the business needs dealing with 97 percentage of our products into sorry uh, solutions or pro initiatives into cacd right and then we talked about this 50 percentage reduction in the feature cost so that's that's a quick uh, uh, constructs how we evolved from a typical uh, layered architecture to a yeah, domain driven design, well respected contracts and APIs, a service oriented constructs, which enabled us to move fast into independently deployable operatable unit value to the market in a, in a very structured way to that maturity level of deploy when ready production ready code anytime one touch deployment. So which means uh, uh, the, the feature to market is almost on a weekly basis, right? So that's, that's, that's a quick uh, uh, function on which the, mo the business mobility thrived. So uh, to start with, okay, from a business mobility standpoint, we talk about uh, uh, mobile one, uh, mobile also to mobile only or mobile first journey. And then we'll talk, uh, we'll talk about how we started uh, getting there, right? Uh, it started with a typical traditional way of looking at mobile solutions as a responsive web API uh, web uh, made, made available on your mobile. But we quickly realized that does the, that doesn't cut the cake. Uh, that's primarily because the mobile experiences are different. Um, the, the, the business or the customers or the uh, colleagues do not want to navigate multiple pages to get to what they do, right? What they want to do. So which means there is an experience which is important to the customer and these are called mobile moments, which they want to go access and do the action and come out of it, right? So which means it is less than two to three seconds when they should be able to operate and trying to get through this web-based web uh, um, responsive, uh, responsive applications on it. It is like a, a trying to put your system of record into system of engagement. So that doesn't really work. So in addition to that, what we realize is, um, uh, as we talked about, um, from a user expectation standpoint, they need to have one experience or rather easy experience, faster experience anywhere and any applications and one touch access, which means, as I said, within three seconds or two seconds, they need to do that operation and come out of it. And then personalization and privacy, right? Making sure everything that they are doing and we don't have access to other personal stuff they are doing on the mobile as well, right? So um, that's, that's an user experience expectation. But when it comes to an enterprise expectation, 
operations. It is information security because they are going, we are going to deal with uh, making sure uh, all the business applications exposed to the users are secure from an enterprise and corporate standpoint. Isolation of personal data and corporate data, compliance and identity, right? So it's basically uh, the access and uh, authentication, uh, uh, two-factor authentication and so on need to be enabled, right? So the work, workspace one enabled us to get or uh, bridge the gap between the user experience expectations as well as the enterprise experience expectations. And uh, we started, okay, um, uh, with uh, uh, two, we started with web, um, web constructs and then we also made sure the 200 applications, which is uh, customer facing, what uh, or, the, or the business facing is made available on um, mobile applications um, using Workspace ONE. So about 30,000 plus users use those. Uh, so it's not only uh, on, on the web, on the laptop, they have the same access and controls uh, using mobile applications as well. But obviously um, the, the fundamental, another challenge was those specific mobile moments where which need to be integrated into a mobile form uh, that can be accessed and delivered, right? Uh, yeah, this is uh, something to do with Workspace ONE, uh, uh, which has enabled us to get there. Adaptive management, native SSO, conditional access, uh, obviously persona-based and role-based access controls, uh, compliance check and verified using multi-factor authentication uh, enabling, right? So that's making sure that uh, uh, the enterprise needs and corporate needs with respect to data and privacy security securities are managed. Uh, and when it comes to the mo uh, enterprise mobility, right? So uh, we didn't. Uh, we started this journey um, stating that okay, mobile first is an option. We did not wait for investments. We carved out a dollar value from the internal budget and start started innovating. And then uh, looking at the persona of the user, start putting together certain mobile moments that can be shipped to the market, right? So like 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 we started with basic. We approve or rather approval where the, the manager need to go to multiple system of records to approve or the people search constructs where he need to have access to a specific set of people know more about the person because if I want to do some sort of a swarming I need to know uh, the support person who, who is dealing with that case and uh, with that customer, uh, I need to deal with uh, uh, who is the R&D uh, uh, person and so on, right? So we try to bring everything together. So we identified those specific mobile moments and then started innovating on it, started creating um, mobile applications and MVPs, and then started releasing those on um, the application platforms, um, mobile application platforms, and it, it was a great success. Then. Uh, obviously, the foundation of this is our ability to deal with contract-based uh, domain-driven design constructs. And so, which means irrespective of the form, the experience was same. So then we realized that really helped. This is where it clicked. And uh, then we started logically from a typical uh, uh, approvals, people such we talked about, mobile flashes, something like uh, quarter-end uh, dashboards for execs to use help desk, right, for uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So which means we try to experiment and pilot with multiple personas, execs, uh, managers, um, the, the normal users uh, who want to have access to the people search and uh, normal users again, right, with respect to help desk. And then started specializing into domains like sales, partner ecosystems, estimators for customers, uh, deal monitoring again from a sales ecosystem. So which means we started experimenting with specific domains and then uh, moving into uh, other um, uh, daily operational aspects, right? Because we need adoption becomes an important in this aspect, right? So basically the uh, EV charger locations identification so that uh, um, the people can identify those locations and go. So which means these applications are adopted and they find that mobile uh, usage is a way to go, right? So we brought in the aspect of domain specific requirements, generic requirements, as well as um, operational requirements together to make this adoption easy in three waves. And uh, uh, yeah, this is some of the uh, uh, sample screens or rather uh, sample mobile applications, um, but it has, um, it has evolved, the maturity level has evolved right now to a consumer grade, but obviously keeping our fundamental philosophy of mobile moments only. So this is the consumer grade experiences for domain specific like partners, sales, and uh, deal monitoring and configurators. And uh, then what we realized is uh, the next step towards is uh, 
uh, moving towards voice experience, chat ex chatbot experience, and also uh, in terms of accessing uh, through um, IoT and other aspects, right? The information made available, so without any interventions, and then so the access is is uh, response is very clear. So it has got the maturity level has evolved to an extent that today. Uh, the all our L1 services like L1 services is support services L1. Some of the support services with respect to operational aspects like order management is made available on this uh, uh, um, chatbot um, with with questions being asked and response being provided even on mobile. So which means the the, the order management executives or uh, the managers have access to the information on the go. Uh, similarly, for the sales ecosystem uh, as well as for partner ecosystem as well. So, which means uh, we are transition. Uh, it's, a, it's a logical transition from a typical um, uh, uh, access to voice-driven approach or a chat-driven approach to solving your problems. Yeah, I think we spoke about this, and uh, this is a quick. Um, summary of what uh, where we are at this point of time uh, we are able to get uh, the the business mobility with greater agility because foundations are well laid uh, because when it comes to mobile applications the feature need to be uh, if we should be able to release a feature on a daily basis or a weekly basis and if anything breaks we should be able to take it to deployment production uh, and production immediately right so the foundations of CACD and the DevOps constructs enabled it the service oriented architecture and the api and domain driven enabled us to a consistent uh, uh, data uh, being consumed or information being consumed across the ecosystem be it system of record system of engagement and in this case mobility as well right the extensibility uh, uh, from a toolkit standpoint what we have from we realize as well as uh, the devops culture into the mobile ecosystem and we talk about continuous delivery which is the, the foundation of our all agility <clears throat> In summary, we are talking about uh, um, from a maturity standpoint for business mobility, we got to an one touch access, a capability, mobile moments, uh, digital workspace combination of uh, uh, or the consumer grade experience, centralized management, single sign on. And uh, the workspace one is the backbone of all the uh, development framework that on which this gets deployed or made available. And we are talking about here currently 30 plus IT uh, developed uh, mobile moments and mobile applications made available to various uh, personas in addition to what we have 200 plus applications on workspace one, right? The day to day transactions like workday and so on that they can go into the details as well. So, so we, we, we spoke about a couple of things, right? the digital transformation, the platform journey, then the mobile transformation. And then we have evolved into a well-structured ecosystem of CNA platform and transitioning logically into the Kubernetes constructs and TKG offerings. And then the path forward from the task to TKG as well in a very structured way. Uh, and the critical applications being deployed today in TAS platform or TCF platform transitioning logically into TKG as well. And uh, with uh, the other components like VRCS, uh, the VRealized login site of, for observability uh, um, and so on, right? Coming Everything coming together to support what we call the CNA platform. The maturity of the CNA platform is so great. Uh, what I would say is the developer need not really bother about, every developer need not bother about what is uh, underlying this, right? It is primarily they focus on feature delivery and that's where uh, that's the value to the market is faster. So quickly, uh, the key takeaways, we are talking about a public cloud experience, even on a private cloud. Um, so which means a 99.95 plus percentage availability for even for a dev test workload uh, and able to have a multi-cloud approach on our public uh, private cloud. So which means uh, the availability is high, there's a the developer productivity is ensured. We're talking about re-architecting the monolith applications through domain-driven design constructs and evolutionary architecture focused on contract and service oriented sorry, service ownership constructs so that it can be consistently consumed irrespective of the form. We did talk about uh, continuous security being embedded as part of the DevSecOps uh, as part of the CI CD process. 
and then we measure ourselves irrespective of the applications, be it packaged applications or the cloud native applications on the key DevOps metrics that is primarily um, uh, the feature velocity, cost of feature and uh, no touch deployments, right? So uh, the maturity need to evolve for all these things in a consistent way. And we have a very well structured DevOps metrics on when I say metrics, there are three components to this, the KPIs, then we have the metrics and measures. So there are well structured metrics and measures rolling up to the KPIs to enable us to measure in a consistent way in the same way, irrespective of the tech stacks that is important. And then automation and tool chains enabling us to uh, get to these DevOps or meeting these KPIs in the DevOps metrics. So that's uh, a quick summary of what we talked about. And uh, good to take questions.